Well, uh, friends, colleagues, citizens, citizenesses, uh, my name is John Keane and I'd like to acknowledge that we're gathered on the lands of the Gadigal people, the traditional and rightful custodians of this place we now call Sydney, and to pay my respects to their past and present elders and to all Indigenous peoples who now are part of our local community. Many people uh, made possible this full house. This afternoon with Glenn Greenwald, I'd like to thank the staff of the Seymour Centre, uh, Meredith Hall from Sydney Ideas. I'd like to thank Professor Nick Enfield from the Post-Truth Initiative here at the University, which is a, a new initiative that's getting at the problem of um, lying and bullshit and post-truth in public life. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to thank Felicity Ruby, uh, who's a doctoral candidate here at the University of Sydney, and who's been our rainmaker throughout. I'd like to thank the Sydney Democracy Network team, who are here this afternoon, uh, and who are periscoping this event. The details are meant to be on the screen, and they're coming uh, soon. Um, SDN is um, a network of uh, partner organisations and individuals uh, very much concerned with the fate of democracy in our times. We have uh, a festival of democracy coming up in mid-September with events on such topics as the kidnapping of democracy, truth, post-truth, why breaking news is broken, and what's to be done about the extinction of species. Uh, lots of stuff is outside. Please do look at it, and please do come along in mid-September. And I'd like to thank um, our two commentators uh, who are already on stage, Dr. Benedetta Bravini. Bene, you are one of our most brilliant researchers and teachers here at the University of Sydney, a journalist, media activist. Everybody who comes into contact with you is struck by your energy and your boldness. I like to say that you think critically and never blink politically. It kind of captures uh, you. You've worked for CNBC and Rye in Milan and New York and London. You've written for the Guardian Index on Censorship, Open Democracy, and our conversation based in Melbourne. You're the author of Public Service Broadcasting Online. Uh, you're the editor of a book uh, called Beyond WikiLeaks. You've written and spoken publicly in recent years at length about why environment matters and why media matters when understanding our environment. And your forthcoming book is called Carbon Capitalism and Communication. Scott Ludlam, unemployed. <laughs> Thanks to section 44 of our Greek constitution and his exceptional integrity, you all know that uh, Scott Ludlam has resigned Parliament. Scott, you're now former, former co-deputy leader of the Australian Greens and former senator for Western Australia. You became an activist in the successful campaign against uranium mining at Jabaluka uh, in Kakadu National Park. You campaigned inside and outside of Australia's parliament for such very big issues as digital rights, the national broadband network, sustainable cities, and renewable energy. You've worked against internet censorship and surveillance, the hounding and arbitrary detention of whistleblowers such as Julian Assange, and the dumping of radioactive waste on remote indigenous communities. Glenn Greenwald. It's a great pleasure and honor on behalf of everybody gathered here this afternoon to say welcome. Ben Vindel uh, to Australia, a land, as you are probably figuring out quickly, a land of indigenous sorrow, split loyalties to China and the United States, and a land currently dragged down by parliamentary homophobia. Nevertheless, a land, as I hope you'll discover, where rainbow and indigenous flags fly over our cities, a wealthy country where the sun shines, a people, nearly half of us, 49% in 2016 census, either born overseas or had a parent who was born overseas. People who are cheeky, cheerful, as you'll find out this afternoon, believe in a fair go for all, 
and who are generally much smarter than their governing politicians. <laughs> Glenn, you write for and co-edit The Intercept, which you helped found in 2013. In English and in Portuguese, it's a platform that works to strengthen talented but under-resourced independent journalism, something, of course, no democracy can thrive without. It's a platform, as you've shown this morning, in a major leak about Pine Gap on ABC Radio National, that strengthens voices and perspectives deliberately ignored and excluded by large media outlets. You were born in New York City, trained in philosophy and law. You practiced litigation for a decade, especially in the area of First Amendment, free speech cases. A bit bored, I understand, and wanting to be more directly involved in public life, you turned to journalism and political writing. You've since become a remarkable man with a mic. Your books have appeared on the New York Times bestseller list. On that list is your most recent book, No Place to Hide, about the US surveillance state and Edward Snowden's shocking revelations. Many people gathered here know you from your reporting on Snowden for The Guardian. It was awarded the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for Public Service. People know you as well from Citizen Four, the astonishing documentary drama by Laura Poitras, which won the 2014 Academy Award for Best Documentary Feature. There's a moment in the film where you say reassuringly, defiantly to Ed Snowden, only a few hours away from his name being named as the source of the NSA leaks, and I quote, fearlessness and fuck you to the bullying tactics have got to be completely pervading everything we do. Well, fearlessness, ruthless honesty, a bodily dislike of arbitrary power, even a taste in matters of law and free speech for defending people you don't like, as you told Rolling Stone in 2013, are your trademarks. People, if you don't know what free speech looks like in action, pay attention to Glenn's writing and his broadcasting. He's its maestro, a champion of what Greek Democrats used to call parhesia, bold and courageous speech that other citizens may not like to hear, but need to hear. Ben Greenwald, you fit no political categories. You don't warm to questions about whose side you're on, boy. You're on nobody's side except those who want to silence, intimidate, or insult others. I've discovered on Twitter in the last few hours that you're called everything under the sun. A Jew, a Russian agent, self-promoting. You have too many dogs, even. <laughs> but the truth is that you're a small D Democrat. And that's why in, for example, hashtag fire Colbert controversy earlier this year, you were willing to take on a homophobic joke by Stephen Colbert. It's also why you've raised doubts about the snooping and the fake news used by Trump's opponents within unelected, unaccountable, secretive deep state institutions such as the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA, institutions marked, as you point out, by a sordid history of atrocities. Glenn, you kindly agreed to speak to us for maybe 10 minutes or maybe a quarter of an hour on the subject of the abuse of power. Friends, a warm welcome, please, for Glenn. to everybody for coming and thanks so much for that very eloquent and, and flattering introduction. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, thank you to, to Sydney uh, Democracy Network and Sydney Ideas for putting together such a fabulous event with a very short period of, of notice. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful for that. I've had a couple of days to spend in Sydney, which is my first time visiting here and I've had an amazing time. Um, probably the highlight thus far was a few hours ago when I was just randomly walking around the city and um, stumbled into your illustrious prime minister. Um, <laughs> he was, he was uh, talking very seriously in front of everybody to some police official looking kind of people, um, inspecting security measures and, and making certain that the citizens of, of Sydney we're being well protected, um, so it's very inspiring to me. To <laughs> uh, just political leaders so engaged and, and so committed. 
Um, I actually wish, I have to confess, um, he's, he's very generic looking. He sort of looks like <laughs> this, this just gray figure from central casting for who would be like a kind of nondescript political operative. So I just, I thought it was him, but I wasn't convinced enough to make a spectacle of myself by rolling questions at him. Um, and had to go back to my hotel room and, and use Google Images to confirm that it was actually him. <laughs> um, so I, I regret that a little bit. Um, so before getting into the, the program, I was asked to give a programming note. Um, we're probably gonna spend a good amount of time talking about surveillance and the debate over privacy and the like. So we've arranged for, after we're done, um, a guest lecture on the intricacies of metadata to be presented by George Brandis. So <laughs> that should be really exciting and, and illuminating. Um, actually, it was funny, I, I remember that clip so, so well, and somebody mentioned it to me last night, I hadn't seen it for a couple of years, and I went back and watched it on YouTube, um, and I have to say, I do actually think it was probably the single most enjoyable and fulfilling moment that the internet has ever produced, <laughs> if you to watch that, that clip, and at this point, there's a whole variety of iterations, people have edited it in extremely creative ways, and they're all equally entertaining, so if you have a couple hours and, and want to laugh at George Brandis, there's fantastic opportunities. Um, so I just wanted to spend a little bit of time, and I'm gonna try and take as little time as possible so that we can have as much time for our discussion and then for audience participation as well, talking about um, a couple of issues that I think, at least for me, create the prism through which I look at everything and talk about everything. And I wanna just begin by asking the question of what is the proper role of a journalist in a democracy, which seems like a really obvious question in one sense, but as the internet has turned so many more people of so many different and diverse backgrounds and experiences into journalists, or at least people who do journalism, the question of what a journalist does and, and what the proper role of a journalist is, I think has undergone a lot of transformations and the answers aren't as obvious as they might seem. So I spend a lot of time thinking about this question as a journalist and as somebody whose journalism has been controversial, not just because of the subject matter of the journalism, but the way in which I choose to pursue it. I've been engaged in a lot of debates with a lot of people, including people who are sort of a classic journalist um, over the course of the last decade about what a journalist should and shouldn't do. So I think the obvious answer or the most um, immediately obvious answer for what a journalist, journalist does is a journalist informs people about what's going on in the world that's of significance. So if there's a fire on a corner down the street or there's a robbery or a murder or there's a potential war or a significant economic policy, journalists tell you about those things. There's a fire down the street, there's a debate taking place, there's a war that's about to start, here's what's happening with those events. But for me, that's really the most superficial and in some sense least useful functions of a journalist because there's so many other bodies and entities and institutions that perform that same function. So if there's a robbery, you don't actually need a journalist to tell you about the robbery. The police will issue a statement and explain that there was a robbery on a certain street. If there's a fire, the fire department or city hall will do the same thing. If there's a war, the government will tell you about all the things it claims uh, is taking place. And so if all journalists do is just kind of recite the basic facts about what's taking place in the world. Their function isn't particularly important because those functions will be performed by so many other entities, by so many other institutions. So I think the beginning premise is that there are a lot of entities and a lot of institutions besides journalists that will purport to tell you about what's taking place in the world. Governments love to do that, corporations love to do that, police departments love to do that. In fact, almost anybody that exercises power by definition will have as part of their function purporting to inform the world about what's taking place. All of those entities employ people whose job it is to do exactly that. They issue press releases, they make statements, they make claims to the world, sometimes they pay for it in the form of commercials, sometimes they go on TV and make all kinds of claims. So I don't think we can think about journalism and a journalist as simply duplicating what all of those institutions are already doing. I think the role of a journalist is defined by what those institutions do. But the key part of journalism is to look at what power centers are claiming, what institutions of authority are disseminating that they want you to think and believe, and scrutinize and investigate 
whether those claims are actually true, to point out the parts of what those claims are, which are actually false or misleading or deceitful, and also to uncover what it is that they don't want you to know that is necessary to complete the picture of what they're actually telling you. And that too might seem really obvious, but in so many ways that is not the function that I think the largest institutions and the largest media outlets in Western democracies actually perform. Because in order to perform that function, you need to have an adversarial relationship to the people who are in power. You need to take their statements and have as your instinct, not amplifying them or repeating them or giving them credibility or reflexively, but digging into what it is that they're saying, to investigating whether or not it's true, to uncovering what it is they're trying to hide, and to making clear when it is that they're lying. It's an adversarial relationship with institutions of power if journalism is to be performed adequately and productively and I think nobly. And the reason I say that is because if you look at how institutions of power conduct themselves, when they disseminate information about what it is that they're doing or they make claims that they want you to think and believe, so often what they're saying simply isn't truthful because they're not engaged in a public service of trying to inform the public. They're engaged in a self-interested endeavor of trying to get you to believe what it's in their interest for you to know. Now, I do think that you know, I, when I say that, I, for me, it sounds like it's almost banal, like it's so obvious that that's what journalism is supposed to be, being adversarial to institutions of power, checking when it is that they're lying, making clear that the things that they're saying aren't actually true. And yet, from the debates that I've had over the last decades since I've been doing journalism, that's actually a very polarizing view of what journalism is. In fact, it's offensive <laughs> to a lot of people who actually do journalism. And one of the reasons why that amazes me so much is because if you look at just American history over the last, say, five decades, probably the most important historical events, the most consequential developments, have come directly from official lying about the most significant events. The war in Vietnam, for example, which killed two million Vietnamese and, and 60,000 Americans and, and dragged on for almost 15 years, one of the bloodiest and most brutal conflicts of the post-World War II era, began essentially when the government lied about a military confrontation it had with the North Vietnamese in the Gulf of Tonkin and it purposely claimed that they had been attacked by North Korean vessels when, as we all now know, the aggressors were actually the American Navy. And that led the Congress and the public to believe that it was necessary for us to go and fight a war in Vietnam, which killed in excess of two million people. Of course, the same thing happened a couple of decades later, the next generation, when the war in Iraq was launched as a result of official deceit about the nature of the weapons capabilities of, of Iraq. And the thing that I remember most when I began to embark upon the Snowden reporting was I remember when I went to Hong Kong and first met with Edward Snowden and my, my, I spent the first day trying to understand what motivated him at the age of 29 years old to risk a life in prison or even death in order to expose what it is that he decided he had to expose. And we talked about a lot of things in the course of that discussion, but the one thing that really struck me was he said in this very indignant tone that three or four months earlier, the director of national intelligence, the senior national security official in the Obama administration, James Clapper, had gone to the Senate and he was asked in, in a public hearing in front of the senator of the United States, under oath, or at least under the legal obligation to tell the truth, he was asked by a senator, so let me ask you, um, Director Clapper, does the United States collect mass amounts of information on the American population? Does it engage in mass surveillance? of the American citizenry and Director Clapper looked into the camera and into the eyes of the Senator asking and he said, no sir, not wittingly. He just lied about exactly what, he denied that the United States government does exactly what it was that in secret they were doing and that Snowden knew that they were doing and that was just offensive to him. So you have this series of extremely significant and consequential lies and those are just a small sampling, maybe just the most impactful but by no means an exhaustive list where government officials and then corporate officials and police officials prove over and over and over and over again that they're lying. And so to me, journalism doesn't really have a positive value if all it's devoted to doing 
is repeating those claims or assuming that they're true or amplifying them. In fact, it's quite toxic, it's quite corrosive and quite destructive if journalism becomes in partnership with institutions of authority. It has to be adversarial to it, it has to be scrutinizing of it, it has to be skeptical of it, um, and it has to be un in an unflinching way willing to expose the lies and expose the deceit of even the most powerful actors. In fact, especially the most powerful actors. And so when I think about journalism, that's what I think above all else is my function. Now I just wanna um, talk about a subsidiary function of journalism, which I think kind of shapes and forms how I think about that overarching role, which is that so often a major part of how institutions of power and institutions of authority deceive the public or disseminate propaganda is by implanting pieties and orthodoxies that people are not allowed to challenge, people are not allowed to question. You're sort of duty bound if you wanna be a citizen in good standing to affirm them and to recite them and to never question them. And so I think that in terms of this adversary role of journalism that I was just describing, one of the primary duties has to be a willingness to question and challenge in a very public and vocal and aggressive way the most sacred and the most cherished pieties that institutions of power have an interest in having people embrace, not because they're always false, sometimes they might actually be persuasive or even true, but because that has to be a critical process of how a democracy functions, is a willingness to question and challenge and critically evaluate the most conventional wisdom. And I think that you cannot be an effective journalist, and I realize this is a very reductive and absolute statement, but it's one that I believe, I don't think you can be an effective journalist if you're unwilling to challenge in a very direct way those most cherished pieties. And that's why at this point, when I go to events like this and um, young people stand up and say, I'm thinking about going into journalism, what's the one bit of advice you would give me? I always say, the thing that I would tell any aspiring journalist or someone considering going into journalism or really any role in which you're gonna have a positive societal impact in a public way is, you can't wanna be like, because if you're too liked and you're too popular and too warmly received as a journalist in a general way, for me it means that you're not doing your job. The job of a journalist has to be to alienate and offend people all the time, especially those in power, because that's its function. And I think you know, one of the, I'm not just saying this because I'm here in Australia and I'm trying to like cater my message to Australians in some patronizing way, like I really, this is the example that even if I weren't in Australia, I talk about when I make this point as one of the most vivid illustrations of this. And I actually wrote about it at the time, it was a couple of years ago. Um, there was an Australian sports journalist, Scott, Scott McIntyre, you all probably remember this story better than I do. Um, and it was on Anzac Day to celebrate the Australian Armed Forces and rather than going onto Twitter and hearing the heroic nobility of Australian soldiers, he provided a reminder of not just the fact that Australian military, the Australian military had engaged in good and positive acts, but also some really bad and shameful ones, including savagely attacking um, uh, defenseless populations and oppressing all kinds of racial and religious minorities and participating with my government and in governments around the world in all kinds of imperialistic and violent acts and that maybe we ought to think about those things as we celebrate the achievements of the Australian military. And I remember the outburst being so quick and immediate at the time Malcolm Turnbull was the minister in charge of the agency that operated the uh, SBS where he worked um, and went on to Twitter and essentially demanded his firing and everybody agreed that he had committed some grave act. Um, nobody suggested that anything that he said was false or inaccurate or misleading <laughs> because it wasn't and nobody could suggest that. Um, in fact, his offense was precisely that what he said was true, but that you're just not supposed to say that, certainly not on this most sacred of days. And so for me, what he was attempting to do was the essence of journalism. It was balancing propaganda and pieties and 
conventional orthodoxy with facts that should make you think about whether or not they're really true. He was trying to present a complete rather than propagandistic picture of history and politics, exactly what you would want a journalist to do. And what happened as a result of his doing that? Did he win awards? Was he hailed for um, his bravery? No, he was, he was fired. And so the fact that a journalist can be fired for doing what I think is the essence of journalism, and that's by no means confined to Australia, that's, you can find examples of that in Western democracies throughout the world, um, I think reflects how, although we reflexively want to believe that the kind of description I'm articulating of what journalism should be is the obvious and uncontroversial one, it's actually really quite polarizing and, and really quite, um, quite divisive in terms of how even journalists think of their own profession. So that's just a few of uh, kind of guiding principles of, of how I try and do my journalism, of how I try and analyze and, and talk about events, and I thought it would be helpful to sort of just lay that out there in as clear a way as I can. Um, and now I will turn to my fellow panelists and look forward to the discussion we're gonna have. Thanks very much. So, people, what we're going to do is uh, there's going to be a question from Benedetta and Scott, and I'll put in my tuppence worth. And uh, Glenn could exercise his right to silence or his right to attack pieties. And then we're going to go to you, and we'll have a first round of questions. So, Benny. Okay, I think I'm going to scrap all the questions I have to do. Because I'm going to burn them, because I, I got so excited about your speech about the role of journalism in contemporary democracies, right? And, um, and you're absolutely right that we need courageous journalists. We need, and that's what we teach, what we try to teach at the university, you know, try to be courageous, try to go beyond, try to ask the question that is not, a, you know, a question that would challenge power. Um, but in light of the huge crisis of the commercial model of journalism that you face, especially in the US, you know, when we look at it, because in Europe we had, you know, the traditional public service broadcasting, and therefore we had a different concept also of doing public interest journalism and different opportunities. So in light of this huge commercial crisis, what would be your solution? Because we know that uh, good investigations also need a lot of resources in terms of funding, in terms of, uh, you know, good um, skills, so what would be your solution? Is it a philanthropic solution? Is it uh, going for a sort of a public service model? Is it to think of a levy, for example, on digital monopolies? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's something that I think lots of people are grappling with. And unfortunately, there really is no one good answer or one good model. It is true that the financial pressures of journalism have really eroded the ability to be courageous in so many ways. Um, one of the kind of underappreciated dynamics of journalism these days is that because it's very difficult to make money in journalism, in fact, most entities are losing huge amounts of money, imagine if you are the head of a newsroom with um, corporate parents who are demanding to know why it is that you're losing money. And you have an opportunity to do a story about, say, um, secret activities within the US government or within the Australian government that you know might subject you to criminal prosecution or to other forms of legal proceedings um, that would be extremely expensive in order to defend against. So now you're talking about not only presiding over a newsroom, which is already losing money, but one that's gonna have to spend $500,000 a month or a million dollars a month just on legal fees in order to have the legal challenges with the government that you know your story is gonna provoke. There's going to be a very strong institutional incentive to say, you know what, maybe we shouldn't do that story. Um, or imagine that even more kind of realistically and probably even more significantly, you wanna do a story about a billionaire who has unlimited resources or about Google or about Facebook. Um, you wanna do an expose on that. And you know that there's a real chance that they're gonna sue you into bankruptcy. We had that in the United States recently where Gawker Media um, did a whole bunch of stories about the billionaire Peter Thiel, who's the founder of PayPal, um, and he went off in secret and used his resources to fund a bunch of lawsuits against Gawker, and now put them out of business. Gawker no longer exists. So if you're the editor-in-chief of you know, a newspaper here in Sydney or a television network, um, and you want to report on a billionaire, what is your incentive to do so? You have lots of incentive not to do so, um, because they can sue you into destruction. Um, and so 
that has led a lot of us who want to do journalism of that kind, right? For me, the only journalism worth doing is the ones where the people with the most money and power want to destroy you, right? That's the only <laughs> journalism that for me is interesting or exciting or worthwhile. And so you need to find models that allow you to do that. Um, you can't go to the largest newspapers and do that kind of journalism. You can do some. Um, sometimes they'll be courageous and um, sometimes they do great stories, but institutionally there's an incentive not to do them, to, to curry favor with those um, entities. And so there are now questions about how to do that. Um, one way is to turn to the public and ask your readers to fund you, um, which is, I think, becoming an increasingly interesting way to do journalism and fund journalism. The problem is that you then become beholden to your readers, um, and that means that if you want to do journalism that your readers dislike, you have the same incentive to avoid alienating them. Um, another way is to um, try and create a model where you convince rich people that just like they support the arts and like they support the opera um, and they support artists, um, they also ought to support journalists um, because journalism is an important public service. That's the model that we used at The Intercept where we found a billionaire willing to fund us and he promised to always stay out of our editorial process and he has, but that too has its downsides because you don't wanna be beholden on rich people um, in order to fund journalism, even if you have editorial independence. So it's become a, a real challenge and you're absolutely right that the financial component um, of journalism has become a major impediment to doing the kind of journalism I'm talking about. Yeah, thank you. Scott. Wow, so I was gonna change the tone a little bit. Thank you so much for your introduction and also for, for being here with us. Who, um, can we get a really quick show of hands? Who heard the background briefing piece on the ABC this morning on Pine Gap? Okay, maybe like 10% if that. So okay, I was gonna put a question that, that goes to that. And so it, most of the audience hasn't heard that, so it's probably fine to go into a little bit of detail. The, um, the difference between stenography, or just repeating what's being fed to you, the official cover story, and the actual purpose of a facility, a spy base like Pine Gap, came through really strongly in that story. There's a cover story which says Pine Gap is about this, then there's the reality. And that, that piece was a tie-up between The Intercept and the ABC. So from your point of view, and maybe I guess with some bearing on the kind of journalism that you do and that you just introduced to us now. What does that particular story tell us about the Australian government's role and the Australian defence industry's role in what's actually happening in the world? So I, I think there's a commonality to all of these different stories that have come from the Snowden archive. And that actually came, that, that story was enabled by documents that were provided by Edward Snowden, but that only told a small part of the story. So the reason that doc, that story took so long was because there was a lot of original reporting that had to be done as well, and it was a great it was great work by ABC, um, primarily as well as my colleague Ryan Gallagher at the Intercept. But I think you see you can look at all these individual Snowden stories, and people always assume that the Snowden story, um, the overall Snowden story, and the individual Snowden stories is about either how it represents an assault on privacy, which is the stories about how. Um, the NSA and its five eyes allies, including the Australian agency, spies on individual populations and individual people without any suspicion of wrongdoing. Um, so there's the invasion of privacy and the assault on privacy, or it's the assault on um, the laws of war, as this story represents and reveals. And I want to talk a little bit about that in detail, but what I want to say in a broader sense is that I remember the first time I, I went through the Snowden archive, it was actually on the plane ride from New York to Hong Kong to meet Snowden. Um, that was the first time I really read through it. And I didn't really have any thoughts. I was mostly hyperventilating for 16 straight hours. So it took me a few days to be able to become a normal functioning human being and to think about and analyze what it was that I was reading. And one of the things I realized early on when I first started reading it, my anger was about this invasion of privacy. You know, the idea that the NSA and its partners were trying to literally collect the entire internet. Um, I remember the documents where, you know, I saw the slogan of the NSA. You know, the NSA has a slogan, like some car rental agency or like airlines or something. And uh, the slogan expresses its institutional aspiration and the slogan of the NSA that appears in multiple documents throughout the entire archive is collect it all. That's the slogan of the NSA. It's not like collect a lot of it or like collect all the terrorist communications. It's not that either. It's collect it all. Um, because the institutional goal of the NSA really is to collect and store and when it wants monitor and analyze 
every single event of human communication and human activity that takes place on the Internet. In other words, the goal of the NSA and its allies is the elimination of privacy in the digital age. That's its actual institutional aspiration. And so my first wave of indignation was about the invasion of privacy. But then what I actually realized was that what these documents show is not so much an assault on privacy, although it does show that, but what's much more important is that it shows an assault on democracy. Because you can have lots of debates among reasonable people about the amount of privacy we ought to enjoy in the age of terrorism and cyber crimes and hacking and pedophilia and whatever scary villains you want to think about to justify an erosion of privacy. You can have a debate about that um, among reasonable people. But you can't actually have a debate about that unless you know what it is the government is doing. And the thing that ultimately shocked me the most about these documents was that I realized that while we have the illusion of democracy, we get to go to the ballot box and like vote for the conservative party, or vote for labor, or vote for Obama, or vote for Mitt Romney or whatever. Um, like we get to go to the ballot box and engage in the ritual of what seems like democracy, especially in the post 9-11 era it, with the justification of terrorism and also um, with finance becoming globalized, by far the most consequential decisions that are made by people who wield power are made completely in the dark. We don't actually know what decisions are being made. And what angered me the most about these documents was that my government and your government and the governments of New Zealand and Canada and the UK had made a decision to convert one of the most important innovations of the last century, which is the internet, into what we all thought it was, which was this unprecedented tool of liberation and democratization into the most unprecedented tool of coercion and control and surveillance ever known in human history. And what offended me the most wasn't the decision itself, but the fact that it was made with zero democratic accountability and zero democratic debate, completely in the dark by unaccountable officials. And so when I think about the Pine Gap story, there are a lot of fascinating implications to it if you're an Australian, which you all are, except for me. Um, <clears throat> which is, you have your government providing critical intelligence to the military of the United States as it engages in a whole variety of, of aggressive, aggressive acts that kill civilians, droning people in the Middle East, um, bombing apartment buildings where there's a single terrorist, but also huge numbers of family members that we know are there and are gonna kill. All of this is done with the critical assistance of the Australian intelligence agencies through Pine Gap, as these documents reveal. It's even more interesting now because now the Trump administration has changed the rules of, of engagement. So as Trump promised to do during his campaign, they are killing the family members of terrorists. They're slaughtering civilians recklessly. Again, all through, all with the critical assistance of your government and its intelligence agency. So again, we can have a debate about how much you want your government doing that. Oh, well, ISIS is coming, we need to go kill them all. I want my government giving everything the United States government wants because um, I, I think our security depends upon being subservient um, and sycophantic to the US government, right? But that, that's a possible line of thinking that I'm sure exists in, in this country and people are entitled to that view. But if you don't know what it is the Australian government is doing in terms of the kinds of acts of aggression it's enabling and centrally participating in, then you can't actually debate it. It's an illusion of democracy. And so for me, what I see that story as more than anything else is a vindication of democracy as opposed to upholding any specific opinions about what the Australian government ought to be doing. So, last question, um, NSA, GCHQ, Five Eyes, uh, you've just pointed out, uh, very powerfully uh, represent an assault, total assault on privacy, um, an assault on democracy, violate laws of war. I want to ask you about the Internet of Things. Uh, it can be a very depressing discussion, but as we all know, I think, gathered here, that in the last several years, there's been an emerging public discussion about corporate um, intrusion uh, into the internet, so that sat navs, social media, new tools like Amazon's Alexa, 
um, are siphoning data on an unprecedented scale and of the most private kind, of the most intimate kind. Uh, and there are wits who say that, you know, the time's coming when our fridges are going to be hacked by Russian or Chinese intelligence uh, as a sort of, you know, symbol of this. I wonder what your take is on this Internet of Things. It's part of our learning of, of uh, the dimensions of surveillance and intrusion. The difficulty, isn't it, with the Internet of Things that it enables people to do things. It's not just repression, it's not just taking things away, but it incorporates, it, it sucks everybody into a system of total information control. Don't you think? You know, I, I, it's interesting because in, a lot of people think about the surveillance debate and the reporting that we did as being about revelations concerning actions by the state because we talk about Five Eyes, we talk about the governments of Australia, and New Zealand, and Canada, and the UK, and the United States. But critical to that whole surveillance network is the cooperation and collaboration of the Silicon Valley giants through which we engage in internet commerce, internet communications, and internet activity, Facebook, and Google, and Microsoft, and Yahoo, and the rest. And one of the really interesting things is that when, before we actually were, uh, before we began doing the reporting, the story of the relationship between the public sector, the governments, and the private sector of, of technology was one of complete marriage. Um, those companies couldn't collaborate enough with these governments. They couldn't provide enough information. They were so eager to um, sort of be the partners of these governments because they got so many benefits in return. And because the spying that they were doing, they were doing in complete secrecy, and so there was no price to pay. And it was only once we began exposing this partnership, like through the PRISM program, um, did suddenly Facebook and Google and Apple suddenly discover the importance of demonstrating their commitment to privacy. Not because they suddenly woke up one day and developed a conscience. I'm sure it will shock you to know that was not actually the reason. It was because they were petrified that the current generation of, of internet users and the next generation of internet users would become very vulnerable to appeals from German or Korean or Brazilian social media companies saying don't use Facebook and Google and Apple because they'll give all your stuff to the NSA. Instead, use our service and we will um, protect your privacy. So now there has become this split, this very real wedge driven between government agencies on the one hand and Silicon Valley companies on the other because these companies now are providing some meaningful degree of privacy, which is one of the great changes of the Snowden reporting there, providing end-to-end -end encryption. They're telling governments they can't turn over information even if the governments get warrants because they're no longer able to access them. You now see governments publicly accusing Facebook and Google of being aiders and abettors of ISIS or at partners with Al Qaeda. And I think this war is great. I want to fuel that fire as much as possible um, because I think it's incredibly dangerous when you have what essentially is a merger of massive amounts of public and private power in this very seamless way um, so that public officials go to work for these private companies when they leave public life. These private uh, officials and private executives become government officials and then go back again and it becomes this one very harmonious cooperative enterprise. And that's particularly dangerous because we now have these giants, like Facebook and Google in particular and Apple, that have compiled more wealth and more power and more data about all of us than any companies in human history. I mean, they're unquestionably more powerful than essentially every government on Earth. Um, and they conduct themselves completely in secret, so the Internet of Things or the development of artificial intelligence with massive implications for what our world is going to be and how it's going to function are done entirely opaquely, completely without transparency. And so before I even get to the question of what do I worry about in terms of their actual activities, um, the broader question for me is how are we going to make sure that these corporations that are really like public utilities at this point, they have no competition, they look nothing like corporate actors in the way of being accountable. Um, what are we going to do to ensure that what they're doing is transparent and also subject to democratic accountability. So for a long time, I didn't really worry about 
this distinction between are you focused on the state or are you focused on private actors because to me they were indivisible. They were really inextricably linked. They're starting to become more separated in part because of these disputes, but also in part because these corporations are becoming more powerful than states and no longer need them. They control them, they influence them, they dominate them, but they no longer need to be in partnership with them. And so I am starting to think more now about how do you focus this kind of accountability, this kind of adversarial journalism, not only on states, but also on private corporations, which in many instances are controlling and, and dominating our lives even more than governments are. Very good, thank you very much. Um, you're doing brilliantly for, I don't know what time of the night it is in Brazil. But, uh, I'm lying to myself about the time. Yeah, so. <laughs> you're, you're in, in great form. Uh, we're gonna take questions um, from students as well, please. Uh, we've got a microphone here and a microphone here. All I ask is that you just state your name. Uh, no long speeches, please, because we don't have that much time. Pointed questions, please don't be shy. Who's first? We can't see you, of course, so come out of the dark. Thank you. And your name, please. Uh, my name is Jefferson, not Thomas, Lee, not Robert. And I left my mobile phone in the car so the NSA couldn't track me to here. But unfortunately, the ticket collector wanted to know my postcode uh, when I got my ticket. So bad news, ticket tech, I gave the wrong postcode. Um, <laughs> I was the convener of the anti-conscription centenary last year and got no money to build a memorial at the local uh, community market in Marrickville uh, to commemorate peace activists and war resistors. Uh, that centenary was up against the war centenary for 14, 1914 to 18 that got 60 million from the government. The second centenary, when the majority of Australians voted no, is December 7th this year. Now, my question is about the Australian newspapers' coverage today saying, how dare we rip down war memorials in America uh, when I've already given away the clue of what I'm saying with the peace memorial that we've established here. Um, Max Watts and one of your citizens, David Courtledge, brought out a book about resistance inside the army, Rita. Now, Max Watts is no longer with us, but that book documents how wars are stopped by resistance inside the army. Can you tell us whether journalists are gonna fulfill that same role, given the fact that Bernard Gaynor is now suing the Australian government for not letting him be racist and sexist and advocating against gender equality and the courts in this country won't allow that to become a free speech issue. So I've rolled my two questions into one. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think, I guess what I'll address is, because I'm not as familiar as I would need to be with a lot of the local um, disputes that you've referenced in order to answer that question well. So I'll, I'll talk in a broader sense about this question of resistance and stopping wars and does that happen inside militaries? And what can journalists do about it? Um, because I think that it actually is a fascinating fact of our political life, and it's true here in Australia, it's true in the United States, um, that essentially ever since the 9-11 attacks, um, Western democracies have been engaged in continuous war in multiple countries all over the world. And one of the fascinating aspects of that is that so much of what we've just been talking about, whether it's surveillance, um, and privacy erosions or government secrecy are justified in the name of terrorism. Um, the fact that here in Australia, in the United States, in the UK, we just saw in Spain, um, countries are being attacked by individuals, um, oftentimes Muslims, um, and that's being converted into this kind of grave threat that justifies this continuing war. And so when I think about how is it that we can resist that, how is it that we can stop that? Um, for me, one of the things that I think is so important to do is to, as I was saying earlier, is to have a meaningful debate in which a lot of conventional orthodoxies are challenged. 
Um, so the standard political response that I know gets made here all the time in Australia, and I'm certain is gonna get made if it hasn't already in response to the story we did today, is that the reason we need to have these activities at Pine Gap, or the reason why we need to have massive surveillance is because we need to protect all of you from terrorism. And typically the explanation given as to why there's terrorism um, is because there's this primitive, hateful, um, irrational religion out there that is arbitrarily attacking us because they hate our way of life. And we need to defend against that um, through all these programs that we've been discussing. And one of the things I think is so fascinating is that the, there are very specific countries that are targeted through this kind of terrorism, and then there are lots of countries that aren't. One of the things I always think about, I, I live in Brazil, and I've, I've lived there for 12 years, and Brazil's way of life um, is very similar to the way of life in Western democracies that we're told is what provokes these kinds of attacks. There's um, gender equality, there's um, sexual liberation, there's cultural freedom, there's religious pluralism. Whatever it is that we're told about our way of life that provokes these attacks exists in abundance in Brazil. And yet there are no Islamic groups, there are no extremist organizations thinking about or plotting or trying to attack Brazil. And there's lots of other countries for which that's true, whether you look at Korea and Japan, or nations throughout South America. Um, there's lots of nations that are liberated in this way that aren't the target of attacks. And yet the countries that are claim that it's because of the way of life. And so one of the things that I think is really interesting about stories like Pine Gap um, that we did today is that what it shows is that the Australian government is working hand in hand with the American government to go around the world engaging in military violence and aggression that is slaughtering huge numbers of civilians. So when we think about why is it that Australia is targeted with terrorist attacks very sporadically and periodically, why are there people who want to do violence to Australians? Why are there people who want to do violence to Americans? Why are there people who want to do violence to the British? I think it's so important to think about what it is that our policies actually are that can play a causal role in causing that terrorism. So if you're gonna be a country that goes around the world for 16 years, proclaiming yourself at war, dropping bombs on lots of different countries, helping the Americans in multiple countries around the world kill innocent Muslim men, women, and children. It only stands to reason, just by nature of, by, by virtue of human nature, that there are gonna be lots of people in the world who wanna come and do violence to you. And so I think that so often um, we allow this narrative about terrorism to persist that alleviates ourselves of our own responsibility. Oh, it's this group over there, this evil, terror, terrible, primitive religion that is different than ours, that is the cause of all this violence. Um, and we're very reluctant to think about what causal role our own government and our own policies play and why it is that people wanna come and bring violence to us. And so I think, not just if you're a journalist, but if you're just a citizen, making certain um, that you have open and honest discussions about why it is that for 16 straight years now we've been at war with no end in sight and what role that might have play in provoking the terrorism. The very policies that we're told are designed to stop terrorism might actually be what's causing and, and provoking it in the first place. And so um, it's not a very satisfying answer because it doesn't result in immediate kind of um, cessation, but I think that is a really important form of resistance is to combat propaganda and to combat self-serving government narratives that continue to fuel a lot of these policies. Briefly, so that Glenn doesn't have to get a, give encyclopedic responses. <laughs> I must apologize, I'll Your might name. be a little, uh, my name is Amar Zafar. So Glenn, I have been following your work for around a decade now, and it has been quite influential in my life. Thank you. And. Uh, you're part of the reason that I left my childhood religion of Islam, and so I blame you for my problems in my family. <laughs> uh, so I think why it has been influential is that I share your opinion about challenging the powerful and standing up for the oppressed. So I think there have been many examples from you, and I think one of them was the Charlie Hebdo article that you wrote. I found it very inspiring and encouraging. But Recently, I have been, I think the right word would be disquieted by some of your, I would say, lack of action in that regard. So, 
uh, I'll try to explain it. I don't know if I can explain it clearly, but like people like uh, Justin Raimondo and uh, Michael Tracy, these are small examples who I think at least try to minimize white supremacy. Uh, and uh, the egregious example is, I would say, Tucker Carlson. I think he's just a spokesman for white supremacy and uh, Western supremacy in a sense. And then when you ask him, he will just go back. So I think he's kind of like Sam Harris in that regard, that you will, you will just say, and then when you ask him, I'll just try to get to a point. So maybe I'm wrong, because I know you are not white supremacist, but when you talk to him on your <laughs> podcast, you <laughs> yeah, your record shows that, but when you talk to him on your podcast, I felt that you didn't challenge him enough on that. Okay, so like softish on white supremacism. Yeah. Right. <laughs> It's not an accusation I expected to be confronted with. No, I think, I, I understand fully actually what you're asking. Um, I think that it's a very American context um, to, to understand what has happened since the election of Donald Trump in the United States, that because of the, the shock to the political system that the election of Trump has actually brought about, there is almost this kind of, I would describe it as like a collective mania, like really a form of societal insanity that has overtaken American political culture. And what it has resulted in is this monomaniacal obsession on Donald Trump as this singular and unique evil in the American political landscape, which if you would only remove him, America could return back to its <laughs> magnanimity and its noble defense of democracy and all things decent that it had been throughout its entire history until Trump was accidentally elected. And this really is the, the prevailing sense. And so I think that one of the, um, th there's been a lot of people who have kind of struggled to gain their footing in the Trump era. And so what does that mean then if you're suddenly um, trying to be adverse to power, does it mean that you just stay on Twitter all day and denounce Donald Trump? Um, or does it mean that you try and put things into a broader perspective? And so I think that um, one of the reasons that there is such an intensive, obsessive focus among American political elites and media elites on Donald Trump is because it's actually very cleansing to do that. Um, a lot of fictions get created around it, like the one that I just described, that until Trump was elected, um, the US used to be so good and decent in the world. Um, that white supremacy basically arrived on the shores of the United States only on November 7, 2016, when Donald Trump was elected. Um, that it wasn't until Trump was elected that America embraced despots and tyrants in the world. And so there's this endless series of narratives and fictions that have been propagated um, that Trump has, this focus on Trump is enabling, that I think is very harmful. And ultimately what I think is so important to realize about Trump is the same thing that I think is important to realize about Brexit in the UK, that I think is important to realize about the rise of Marine Le Pen and other nationalists throughout <laughs> Europe, is that there have been policies, very specific and deliberate policies implemented by Western elites over the last 30 years, globalism and free trade and international finance and endless war that have displaced the security of hundreds of millions of people inside of these countries. And so you have populations inside the United States, inside Great Britain, inside Australia, inside Brazil where I live, that are extremely uh, dissatisfied and discontent and angry with the prevailing order and the ruling class. And that's the reason why when the elite media that they despise tells them not to vote for Brexit, they go and do it, not in despite of that, but because of that. Because they want to do anything that uproots the system. Or they're told that Donald Trump is this um, hideous, um, you know, assaulter of women and this crass pig, all of which is true, and yet they go and vote for him anyway. Why? Because their lives have led them to be so angry about what has been done to their economic welfare and economic security. And so I think it's extremely important not to allow an escape of elite reckoning by pretending that um, this accident of Donald Trump's election or the accident of Brexit, if we can just reverse that, will actually fix everything. Um, I think that it's extremely important to put them in context and to try and understand what actually has led to them. And so it isn't that I disagree with the view that Donald Trump is a white supremacist. Anybody can see that he is. Anybody listening to him, would it would be impossible to deny that. 
What I dislike and have trouble with and object to is the idea that it's Trump and Trump alone that is the embodiment of this process, these, the, the, this worldview, and that if we just get rid of him, all of this will be fixed. For me, the people who are creating that, men, that, that narrative, that it's Trump and only Trump, um, are trying to evade responsibility for what they've done and who they are. And so I'm not trying to exonerate Trump and white supremacy. I'm trying to diffuse the responsibility where I think it belongs, which is in a much broader mm -hmm. circle of actors than just Trump and those who voted for him. Um, so that's really the, the, the objective. Yeah. 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 As briefly as you can. <laughs> Hi Glenn, Hi. Uh, I'm Vishal, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I just wanna ask you about, uh, you know, humans nowadays, we consume news. Um, basically, what we, like, we would be reading the things that we already believe, right? So journalism, in a sense, it would be preaching to the public and that's to, to the, the choir in that sense. Um, whether it's like, Google al algorithms or news or Facebook algorithms showing us what we already like, just kind of supporting our own view. I guess my question would be, how can journalism, in your opinion, bridge that gap in reaching the audiences that, you know, that they would to create this kind of change and perform the function that journalism has to perform? Yeah, it's a great question because it is actually true that one of the promises of the internet originally was that it was gonna make us all interconnected. We were all gonna be part of the same global conversation, and as a result, the walls between us were all gonna break down. And in some senses that has happened, and in other senses the opposite has happened, because it has allowed us instead to be atomized. We can all just kind of retreat into this really pleasing, self-selected echo chamber where our views and our biases and our prejudices are constantly reinforced, um, I can't tell you how often, pretty much every day, somebody will say to me on Facebook or on Twitter or by email, um, hey, you know, you just said this thing that I disagree with, so now I'm unfollowing you. You know, it's not like, <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm physically incapable of ever hearing an opinion that isn't an echo of the one exactly that I believe. Um, and so, you know, you can actually use technology in that way, and I think to do that is really self-destructive. Because if your opinions are never being questioned and your assumptions are never being challenged, all you're doing is ensuring your own stagnation. And you're reinforcing your own errors and you're really limiting your intellectual horizons. And so you do have that choice though. And I know for me as a journalist, um, I really try and force myself to constantly expose myself to the people and things and ideas that I hate most. Um, like this gentleman was just asking me about this interview that I did with Tucker Carlson. He was saying, um, you know, I think you were too easy on him. I don't know, I'm, I'm happy to listen, have anyone listen to that. And I think um, you know, one of the benefits of why I wanted to have that interview with him was because I wanted him to have to confront criticisms um, that he typically has thrown at him that he often gets to ignore. Because I think that in that clash of ideas is where truth is found. Um, and so, you know, one of the things besides exposing myself to those kinds of um, dissenting views is making sure that my readers never come to read me with the expectation that their own views are gonna be flattered. Um, there are lots of times when I know that a position I'm gonna take is offensive, to or um, at least divergent from the vast majority of my readers and I'm tempted to remain silent in those instances, but those are when I instead force myself to be most clear about what it is that I'm thinking because I think I'm doing my readers a great service by angering them, by unsettling them, by making them the, the kind of angry where you have to force yourself to think about why it is that you're right. So ultimately it's all up to you. Um, you can use the internet to hide and to insulate yourself and to just have your own views reinforced, or you can actually use it to seek out in the most powerful way exactly those views that, that make you question the things that you, you believe in most. And I just hope everybody chooses the latter. I think our, our polity and our discussion will be so much more improved if they do. I'd like, um, I'd like a woman to speak uh, to ask a question next. Please stay in place because we'll come back to you, okay? Please. 
Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Elena, and uh, <clears throat> I have a question because you were talking about how um, the states, as oh, the private companies are now become bigger than the government. But then I think of the example where the European Court of Justice actually <clears throat> said that Google has to give people the right to be forgotten. So wouldn't that be a, like this precedent? Don't you think that other governments might also have this power over the private companies? Yeah, yeah, you, you're absolutely right. It's not an absolute thing. I mean, these companies still pay taxes to state authorities, which is a form of, of obedience and submission on some level. Um, they sometimes get fined by regulators. Um, there's talk in the United States about regulating them as a private utility. There's talk in, the, in, in Europe about breaking them up um, as monopolists or applying antitrust legislation to them. Um, Microsoft had a huge battle with the US government. Um, so I don't mean to at all imply that they're omnipotent. Um, they are still subject to the law, at least in a theoretical way. But what I mean is that there are very few constraints being imposed on them democratically or officially when weighed against their enormous power. And every year that goes by, they assemble more money, they assemble more data, um, and they assemble more authority and more unchecked and even not understood um, ability to influence the world. So you're right um, that there is still some attempts to try and gain control of some of their power. Um, but I think if you look at the trends, it's less and less and less. Um, and you have these behemoth authorities that really do exercise unprecedented power um, with very few constraints and very few um, ability to even know what it is that they're doing. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take one more, uh, but if you're in the queue, please stay one more, and then we're going to come back to Scott and, and Benny. Please. Uh, hi, Glenn. I'm Fergus. Uh, so, in US presidential elections, it's virtually impossible for a third party candidate to win. This leads to a lot of Democrats blaming third party candidates for costing them the election instead of looking to their own failures. While I don't agree with that line of reasoning, uh, it is the case that the immediate material impact of voting for a third party is basically the same as not voting. And if there's some longer term goal, uh, you know, we, I feel like we don't have time to wait for climate change and nuclear weapons uh, while Donald Trump is uh, acting very poorly on those issues. So my question is, uh, how did you cast your ballot last November and how do you reason about that? <laughs> also, I'm a big fan. Did you, you expect it? I was going to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I just, uh, so let me, and the only, I don't want to be coy about it. The only reason why I don't talk about who I voted for or anything like that is because I really, do, I think it is much more difficult to do my job if I attach myself to a political party. Um, and I also think it's kind of pompous to tell people how they should vote. I try and give people information and, make, and let them make up their own minds. I think that's a much more respectful and value, valuable role. Um, so, let, but let me just address the, the broader question, which is I'm always amazed at this idea that if you're a political party, like the Democratic Party, where you're a political candidate like Hillary Clinton, and you fail to do your job, which is convincing the electorate to vote for you, that the instinct is not to say, what is it that I did wrong? It's to find all the culprits who are actually to blame, mm -hmm. like the Green Party, or like Russia, or whoever, the media. Deplorables. Yeah, the, the deplorables. Um, you know, I think that one of the critical um, failures of center-left parties, and I definitely think you see that here in Australia, maybe even more than the US, um, is a failure to articulate an alternative that makes people want to vote for you, that convinces them that you're going to make their lives better if you win. And if you fail to persuade enough people that they should vote for you because you're going to make their life better, then the fault is entirely with you. And you know, I think that um, if you look throughout Europe, for example, center-left parties are virtually disappearing. I mean, the fascinating part about the French election was that the Socialist Party basically disappeared. Um, and the far-left candidate, Mélenchon, almost made the runoff. 
And you see it in Portugal and you see it in Spain and you even see it in the United States where all of the energy is not with the establishment wing of the Democratic Party and Hillary Clinton types, but with Bernie Sanders and even further left candidates. You certainly see it in the UK where those Blairites just lost one election after the next and the only thing that finally revitalized and energized people was the candidacy of Jeremy Corbyn. And so I think that um, you can certainly do what you're doing, which is saying, well, if you cast your vote for the Green Party, aren't you really nullifying your own vote? Um, and in some cases that might be true. I think a lot of the people who voted for the Green Party, if the Green Party didn't exist, wouldn't have voted for Hillary Clinton. They simply wouldn't have voted. Mm -hmm. um, one of the amazing aspects of US political life is that um, something like 40%, 40% of the US population didn't think it was worth bothering to go and vote. And you can say, oh, they had an obligation to stop Donald Trump, but they're incredibly deprived of so many things and they voted for Democrats for many years and their lives never improved. So you can blame them for, I don't know, what, um, not like theoretically thinking that Hillary Clinton would be better to stop climate change, but it's the job of politicians and the job of political parties to motivate and inspire people. And they're failing to do so in so many countries around the world. Um, and I think it's them who we ought to be hold, holding accountable and not people who commit the crime of deciding they're gonna run against them or people who decide that it's not worth getting up and going waiting in line for three hours because their lives aren't gonna be materially better if they do so. Um, so I understand the instinct, but I think that that blame and that recrimination should be directed at the political parties that have so clearly failed the people they're supposed to be representing. Patience is a great democratic virtue, so those standing up, you can just stand up a little bit longer. We're going to come back to Scott and then to Bene, and then we'll come for another round of questions. Right. Scott. Thank you. That's an excellent segue into what I wanted to ask you about, if we can stay with elections for a second. So it's kind of settled doctrine now in certain quarters of the US, commercial media at least, that the Russian government either interfered with or outright stole the election off of, off of Hillary and that WikiLeaks played a, a naive or a subordinate role, and you and your colleague Jeremy Scahill, in being quite determined not to jump onto that line of argument, have been criticised for maybe going a little bit soft on Putin. I don't want to put words in other people's mouths here. So what's your view of what actually happened, and can you maybe throw a bit of context around how the debate's playing out in the US? Sure. So I have a view about all of this that I still even though I know it makes so many people so angry, <laughs> I really genuinely regard it as not particularly controversial, which is that the US government claims, it claims that it has information that not only was it Russians who hacked into the email servers of the DNC and John Podesta's email, Hillary Clinton's campaign manager, but that it wasn't just Russians who did it, but it was the Russian government at the direct orders of Vladimir Putin. So Vladimir Putin was sitting in the Kremlin, so the story goes, <laughs> and he like walked up to whoever he walks up to and he's like, I order you, my hackers, <laughs> to go and like send phishing links to John Podesta, he knows John Podesta and he wanted like a phishing link sent. And he, I don't know how he knew, but like I guess he knew that John Podesta was going to be really stupid and like click on the phishing link, <laughs> and like it was going to lead to a page that said, "Oh, Google needs your password. What is it?" And he was going like, to enter it. This is the great crime of the century. And okay, so that's like that's I'm not like exaggerating. I, that's really the, that's what the U.S. government is saying happened. They maybe say it in a little bit more of a serious tone, but that's basically the story. So. All I've said from the very beginning is, I'd like to see evidence for that. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I just want to see the evidence for it instead of just hearing the claims. And like a major reason why I want to see the evidence for it is because the agencies who are making this claim, the CIA and the NSA primarily, are you know not known as the most truthful people ever. <laughs> like they have on occasion stumbled into falsehoods. <laughs> and so, but the problem is, is that this storyline has taken on a religious significance because if you're an American 
and you see somebody like Donald Trump winning an election, what do you want more than anything to believe? You want to believe that this didn't really happen in America. It happened because a foreign villain made it happen. And so I think our effort as journalists has been to try and bring about skepticism in the first place, saying, look, it may very well be true that the Russians hacked these email accounts. Like, I know it's upsetting to believe, but the US also hacks other countries. Um, I know it's shocking. The US <laughs> like, occasionally in other countries. Like yes, the US <laughs> occasionally interferes in the internal affairs of other countries. <laughs> so I'm not it wouldn't it wouldn't shock me if the Russians did something like that. It's not like I'm saying that this couldn't have happened. All I'm saying is before we like all believe it and run around angry about it and impose sanctions over it and restart a second Cold War because of it. We ought to see some evidence that is actually true. And that is, has become blasphemous. In fact, you're basically subjected to allegations that you're a Kremlin agent simply for wanting evidence that this actually happened. Um, but you know, that's the kind of role that I was talking about earlier in journalism is that I know that it's gonna make a lot of people angry because it's very important for Americans to believe it took place. They really do believe it. And even asking for evidence for it is considered offensive. On the question of WikiLeaks, my attitude is exactly the same. Um, I know Julian pretty well. Um, you joined us on, she's a very complicated person, so I don't pretend to be able to predict all of his actions or to rule things in or rule things out. My strong belief is that he would rather swallow cyanide than take orders from any government <laughs> um, or be knowingly manipulated by a particular government or be its tool. Um, Julian likes to think of himself as the puppet master and not the puppet. Um, so I'm skeptical of this claim that WikiLeaks is now, is now in league with the Russians or is some kind of a Kremlin agency. Again, I don't rule it out either because I don't have evidence that it didn't happen. But my view is that before you go around accusing um, media outlets or whistleblowing um, outlets or citizens of being agents of Vladimir Putin, you ought to have evidence that you can de present that demonstrates that it's true and so far none has been presented. So my view on that is just one of basic skepticism that I think all journalism ought to require, which is, you know, I'm willing to believe something is true as long as you show me evidence for it and if you don't, then I'm not. And that's essentially how I see it. Then, um, before I ask you a question on uh, freedom of speech, really, because I think that actually we haven't touched upon that very important topic for you, um, I just wanted to briefly comment on the right to be forgotten, because actually I think that the decision coming from Europe is actually a, a solution of defeat in a way, because we have to come to the conclusion that we have to ask Google to enforce the right to be forgotten, because we are powerless in front of this big global digital giants. And so, as you mentioned earlier, probably, you know, they, they almost feel now they don't, don't need states any longer because they feel that they're so powered, so empowered. And so I, I think um, you have a great quote, a brilliant quote in your book that says, transparency is for those who carry out public duties and exercise public power. Privacy is, a, is for everybody else. And so I think everybody else but global digital giants, right? So again, a question on transparency. You know, what can, how do we achieve transparency? So that's the first part of the question. And if John allows me, then I'll ask you the second part that, is, that relates to another topic, which is free speech. So in the aftermath of um, Charlottesville, you wrote this very strong defense of the American Civil Liberties Union. And uh, you actually, um, as an organization that obviously defends the rights of everybody and the rights, the free speech rights also of white nationalists. So, um, what would be your solution in the face of people abusing this right by vilifying others or on grounds of race, on grounds of religion and nationalism? So it's two questions in one thing. <laughs> well, they're actually um, very related. So in case you get in trouble, um, if I ask a few questions, I'll later argue. <laughs> it was actually one, it was one A and one B. I think we can look at it as. Um, so, you know, at the heart of most of what I believe is um, a distrust of how human beings exercise power when there aren't 
aren't subject to lots of checks and limits because I think human beings will abuse power if, if they can. It's just human nature and power is corrupting. I'm not the first person to observe that. And so the debate over free speech, um, I think is a little bit different in the United States than it is in pretty much every other Western democracy. Um, it's definitely different than it is in Brazil, which is where I live. Um, because in most Western democracies, there is this prevailing sense that we need to have limits on free speech. Um, that there are certain political opinions that are just so egregiously dangerous and evil that they cannot be allowed even to be heard. That it ought to be a crime to express them or we ought to use the force of the state in order to limit them. Um, that's essentially the prevailing is probably worse than or more extreme than almost any other. So the idea that we ought to have an absolutist view of free speech, that there never ought to be any political idea or political opinion that should be declared by the state to be off limits, is one that for most people outside the United States and increasingly for people in the United States, um, is something that sounds really dangerous and extreme. And I'd be willing to bet even in this audience, um, there are a lot of people who find that troubling, the idea that all political views, including um, racism and white nationalism, um, homophobia, um, animosity towards Muslims, that that ought to be all permitted. And in the United States, there is this greater tradition of free speech on you that you and find the idea that we ought to turn to the state to limit um, the ideas that can be expressed very um, disturbing and actually quite dangerous is, is a couple of reasons. Um, and it really relates to the question of whether we want governments regulating the content of the internet, stopping fake news, having pressuring Facebook to get rid of terrorism posts, is that so many of these terms are completely ill-defined. So you may think that you have a really good understanding of hate speech. And my guess is that, you know, if we took a poll, there'd probably be 90% of the people who would say, yes, we can define hate speech. Hate speech is, um, any kind of animosity towards a vulnerable minority group. Um, racism against black people or against Latinos, um, anger and animosity and condemnation against um, LGBTs, um, denunciation of, of Muslims, anything that is designed to denounce or intimidate or demean um, vulnerable minority groups. And one of the problems I have with that that, that definition, as reasonable as it might sound, is that it's so easy for it to proliferate into things that you wouldn't actually be comfortable with. So for example, in France, hate speech laws are now used to prosecute people who wear t-shirts advocating a boycott of Israel. So if you are somebody who, as I do, believes that the decades long Israeli occupation of Palestine is illegal and brutal and a war crime, and you believe that just like the South African apartheid regime in the 1980s was weakened and then brought down by boycotts, so too should the Israeli government be weakened and brought down by boycotts until they end this occupation. And you advocate that by wearing a t-shirt. In France, that's considered hate speech. That's considered to be demeaning a vulnerable minority, which is Jews. It's considered to be anti-Semitic. And people who have worn boycotting Israel t-shirts have been prosecuted in France for doing so. In the UK, if you go onto Facebook as a Muslim and you say something like, these British soldiers were just killed in Afghanistan, and rather than regretting it and mourning it, I'm celebrating it because I think they're invaders and I think they're imperialists and I think that they don't belong there and the people in Afghanistan have a right to defend the sovereignty of their own country, an opinion that might be repellent to you or might be horrifying, but it's an opinion a lot of people share. If you go on and express that view on Facebook, you will be prosecuted under hate speech laws in the United Kingdom as Muslim teenagers have been for writing similar things. And so I always have a very hard time understanding how you can on the one hand say, I think the governments of Australia and the UK and the United States are authoritarian and racist and xenophobic. And then on the other hand say, I want to give them the power to decide which ideas are permissible and which ideas aren't. Because you may start with the hope that all the ideas that you hate will end up on the prohibited list, but it's very easy to see. In fact, I think easier to see how a lot of ideas that you like might end up being 
prohibited as well. So that's one thing is I think once you endorse the principle that it's okay to allow the state to punish certain ideas, you're gonna end up with ideas on the prohibited list that you should probably think shouldn't be there. And then the other thing is I just think that the history of human knowledge um, is that we often are so sure of what it is that we know. We are so certain that things we believe are correct. And every generation, the history of every generation is that it finds things that the prior generation believed with certainty that end up being repudiated, being denounced, being viewed as error. And so I don't trust myself as a human being. I don't have the hubris necessary to say that there are certain views that I hold that I'm so confident in that I want it to be illegal to question them or disagree with them. I don't have that belief in myself or in anybody else that we have that ability. I think it's always better to allow ideas to get aired and debated and discussed. And then finally, I think the most important part about why I, I can't get on board with this idea that we should be restricting ideas is because it'd be nice, it really would be nice if we could write a law that would make racism disappear. Like you can write a law saying, racism is no longer able or legal to express or Islamophobia or homophobia. But that doesn't happen. You don't get rid of ideas by banning them. In fact, often what times happens is the opposite. Those ideas become stronger because it seems like society fears them. The people who express them start to become martyrs. Um, and you actually end up strengthening those groups by making them victims of censorship. And so I just think it's more practically um, wise and I think on principle it makes more sense to take the position that the state should never be censoring or forcibly declaring as illegal any kind of political viewpoints and finding much more effective strategies than turning to authoritarian states to ask it on our behalf to get rid of ideas that we don't think we're capable of defeating ourselves. One last, you're still going strong, one last uh, quick question about the growing gap between rich and poor. Um, and it's connected to Scott's question and the other question about third parties. There have been various points in the past few years, Glenn, when you've gone on record, for example, in 2011 during the Obama presidency about civil liberties, saying that the problem is to bust the two-party system and to create spaces for alternatives. And you sounded like Bernie Sanders in that period before his time. And you mentioned uh, Sanders again today. I mean, since that time, we've become more widely aware that things are worsening in matters of the gap between rich and poor. You know, the golden rule is becoming that those with the gold rule, to put it crudely. And that's true for Brazil, as you've written about so powerfully in the last year, uh, and the United States. Is this doing anything to your politics? This, this problem of plutocracy, as it's sometimes called, you know, is it, is it beginning <coughs> to reshape the way you think politically about the abuse of power? Actually, I, I think it is, and it goes back to what the gentleman here asked me about earlier about my, my, my political posturing and viewpoint in the age of Trump, um, and why is it that I don't just denounce Trump and sit around and say, oh, if only Hillary had won, things would be so much better. Um, you know, I, I spent um, a good amount of time this summer in Wisconsin, um, this Midwestern state where that was probably the most surprising state of all the states that voted for mm. Trump that people expected that would actually vote for Hillary. In fact, Hillary famously never visited Wisconsin because she was so sure she would win. Um, which of course is everybody else's fault, like the Green Parties. But um, so I spent a long time there and one of the things that I really came to appreciate and understand was, you know, you can look at statistics about how huge segments of a population in Western Europe and the United States are actually declining in life expectancy. People as medic medicine advances are dying sooner. Um, and you can look at statistics about people not being able to afford to send their kids to school or to um, have health insurance for them, and they can all be very abstract and you can talk about income inequality. But when you actually go and, and, and spend a lot of time with the people who 
um, whose statistics are represented, whose lives are represented in these statistics, you, what you really see more than anything else is not these um, metrics of economics and wealth inequality, but a kind of like uh, disease of spirituality. They, they don't think that they have any future. They, they, they don't wake up in the morning with any sense of possibility for themselves. They, they, they are struggling to survive and they see this massive amount of wealth all around them um, at a time that their deprivation is increasing. One of the big epidemics in the United States right now that's sweeping up huge portions of the middle of the country is a drug epidemic, an opioid epidemic. Um, for people under 50 in the United States now, the leading cause of death is no longer HIV or car accidents or heart disease, it's drug overdose. And there's been a lot of research about how what really causes addiction, and there's actually um, a doctor here in Australia who has done some pioneering work on this, and um, people throughout Europe as well, um, that what causes addiction is a lack of hope, a lack of spiritual connectedness, and a lack of um, just uh, that sense of possibility in life, and that's why people turn to drugs. And so when you see just the kind of human suffering and human deprivation and human misery, that part, that policies endorsed by both political parties in many countries, including here in Australia, including the United States, including in Western Europe, have endorsed of globalism and free trade and industrialization and jobs overseas, and you know more and more resources going to the top 0.1 percent. Things like Brexit and Donald Trump and you know Uber uh, nationalism in Europe start to make more sense. Not because you support it or think it's valid, but you understand why people are turning to extremism. And so you start to realize that simply getting some more votes for some centrist parties that are slightly kinder and gentler and more diverse, but the same fundamental policies really isn't a solution to any of that. Um, I really do think that, you know, if Donald Trump had won and Hillary Clinton had won, it wouldn't have averted disaster. It would have just, it just delayed it. it would have just delayed it. Um, all these patterns and all these trends are leading to some really, I think, cataclysmic outcomes. And if we don't find pretty radical solutions to them, by which I don't mean vote for Hillary Clinton, um, I mean more systemic approaches, then I think that these um, erosions are going to accelerate. And so they definitely change my politics in the sense of what I think is needed. Um, in order to deal with some of the pathology we're discussing. Thank you very much. We haven't got all that much time, but let's take some questions. If you could make them very brief, and your name, please. Hi, my name's Chris. Um, uh, to what extent uh, has the US Supreme Court's lack of reverence for the Fourth Amendment uh, influenced NSA policy and practice? Yeah, I mean, for those you know who don't know, the Fourth Amendment is supposed to guarantee the right to privacy, essentially, um, the um, ability of human beings to be safe in their home and in their papers and in their persons from unreasonable searches and seizures. And if you actually take that seriously, then it becomes impossible to understand how the U.S. government can just engage in mass surveillance against entire, the entire American population collect every single record of who we're talking to and for how long. I mean, if nothing, if that doesn't violate those guarantees that you just referenced, then what does? And the problem is, is that in the wake of 9-11 and the whole war on terror, um, so many Western institutions have become uh, malfeasant in their function and the Supreme Court is supposed to safeguard that and instead in case after case after case, it is bowed to the government in the name of terrorism. So people who go into court um, and say my Fourth Amendment rights have been violated, or I'm the victim of torture by the US government, or I've been rendered and kidnapped by the US government, all the government has to do is go into court and say, in the name of terrorism, these policies are too secret for you, the court, to even adjudicate them safely. And the court says, okay, and they dismiss the case. So I think that there are lots of institutions that have been, um, that have failed in their functions. The US media certainly has, the Congress certainly has, and, and courts have as well. But it all gets back to what we were talking about earlier, which is the ability of our governments to take what is still an incredibly minuscule threat. Um, I mean, even if you live in a place like Australia that has had terrorist attacks, or the US that had terrorist attacks, 
you are more likely to die by slipping in the bathtub and hitting your head on the concrete or going out to dinner tonight and contracting an intestinal virus or getting struck by lightning, mm -hmm. you're more likely to die by all of those things. That's not hyperbole, that's just probability, than you are through a terrorist attack. And yet terrorism we've allowed to evoke all of our tribal fears, all of our um, anger and worry about other, all of our survival instincts because it's been manipulated um, into having all of those freedoms eroded. And, and that's just one of the many. It's uh, Bradley Hughes, uh, digital asset coach on Twitter. Been a long time follower of you and your journalism, Glenn, and uh, appreciate your great work. And uh, I've uh, basically got a, um, a, a sort of a centre left progressive view of politics, uh, former Greens councillor and deputy mayor, and respect to Scott for his principled uh, decision to uh, resign immediately upon finding out he was a dual citizen. I wish others in our um, political body would uh, follow that exactly example. Uh, but, uh, down to my question. Um, National Australian Bank on Wednesday night made a presentation to Australian financial regulators on uh, the coming of open banking. Uh, open banking is going to be a, a, a rising thing where banks and financial institutions will share their data on their clients to other companies provided people give their general consent. That, that will make it easier to acquire services. Um, I tweeted today that um, a, an assertion or a provocation that um, people value their time over privacy. Um, there is a political element to this question as well. As a, as a polity or a group of citizens, how much uh, effort should we expend upon um, protecting our privacies with the tools available and using alternative systems like old search engines like DuckDuckGo that doesn't track people, um, using uh, VPNs, etc. Or should we all just accept that uh, Big Brother in the form of the state and the corporates have our best interests at heart and just get on with our lives? Because let's face it, we're all damn well busy just trying to get by and you know, be part of our families, raise our children, etc. So what's what's the compromise? Where's the trade-off? Do we fear the, the consequences of our metadata and all of our information to the extent that we should take active measures, all of us, to protect it? Or should we just kind of uh, think, oh, well, it's more convenient to have access to these uh, enhanced services? Yeah, it's a, it's a critical question, and, and I wish we had more time to talk about it. I actually gave a TED Talk on, on that question about the value of privacy, because we've been encouraged to believe that our privacy is irrelevant, that as long as we're not terrorists or pedophiles or criminals, that we have no reason to value privacy. I, if you're not doing anything wrong, um, you have no reason to care if people are watching what you're doing. Um, and that's been encouraged by everybody from Mark Zuckerberg, who has said privacy is dead, to Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, who said, oh, if you're doing something that you don't want anyone else to know that you're doing, that's probably a good sign that you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Um, and there are a lot of people things. Um, one is that anybody who says, well, I don't really care about my privacy, I don't have anything to hide, um, you know, I know for a fact that the people who say that don't actually believe it because all of us have things to hide, every single one of us, even if we're not a terrorist, even if we're not a criminal. There are things that we're willing to tell our lawyer or our spouse or our psychologist um, or our best friend that we're, we'd be mortified if everyone in the, anyone in the world knew. We all take steps to safeguard our privacy. We put locks on our bedroom and bathroom doors and we use them. Um, we put passwords on our email and social media accounts. Um, we all are social animals, and so we do want to have other people know what we're doing. Um, but equally critical to being a free human being is the ability to go to places where you can think and explore um, without the uh, judgmental eyes being cast upon you. And I guess the one thing I would say, and again, it's a huge topic, and I, I wish we had more time on that, um, but you know, I've gone around the world for four years debating now surveillance and privacy. And every time somebody says to me, you know what, I really don't care about my privacy, I trust the government to watch what I'm doing, I don't use the internet to plot terrorist attacks, I just you know, plan my kids little league games and carpools and I don't really have anything to hide, I always say the same thing to those people. Every single time someone says that to me, I say, I take out a piece of paper and a pen and I write down an email address and I say, this is my email address, when you get home, what I want you to do is I want you to email to me 
all of the passwords to your email accounts and social media accounts. <laughs> like not just the like nice, respectable work ones in your name, but all of them. Um, so that I can just kind of troll through them and find what you're doing and then just publish it online under your name. Because after all, if like you're not doing anything wrong, you have no reason for me not to do that. And to this day, nobody has <laughs> Like I check that email account very like frequently and it's a very desolate lonely place <laughs> and the reason is is because we all understand that if we believe that we're constantly being scrutinized and constantly being monitored not even if we are actually being monitored but even if the possibility exists that our behavioral choices limit significantly that the choices we make are a byproduct of what's expected of us what so, so societal orthodoxy demands of us as opposed to being a byproduct of our own agency. It's really exclusively in the realm of privacy do things like creativity and exploration and dissent reside. And so I think even those of us who are willing to say, well, I don't really care about privacy, there are other values more important. I think instinctively we understand why we lose so much when we allow the zone of privacy to be eroded. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'm actually going to go to the right here, uh, and uh, what I suggest is that uh, we're running out of time. Could you briefly put your questions? We'll take a handful, and I want to give Bene and Scott um, some final words, as well as Glenn as, uh, too. So just very briefly and pointedly. Hi there, I'm Nicola. So in the last year or so, with the rise of the Trump administration, we have actually seen the rise of a much more adversarial popular news media. So what do you think the news media is doing well? What do you think it's doing badly? And is this in response, this response due to Trump being a unique threat to democracy and the usual functions of the state, or is it due to some other factors? Yeah, you know, it's so ironic because I, when I started writing about politics, it was in 2005 in the Bush era, and it was just two and a half years after 9-11, or three years after 9-11, and just a couple of years after the war in Iraq. And what really drove me more than anything to start writing about politics was, my view that the US media had become so anemic, so subservient, so fearful, um, even to the point where not only did they not investigate the claims made to justify the Iraq war, but the Bush administration was using techniques that the world had forever described as torture. And because the Bush administration told the US media that it wasn't torture, the US media stopped calling it torture. Um, because they said, hey, some people call it torture, and some people say it's not, who are we to decide? Um, so the whole mentality of the US media was this very petrified, compliant um, organ of power. And I've been arguing with media figures for a decade that they ought to call it a lie when government officials lie, that they ought to have this very adversarial, hostile relationship to power. And suddenly with the election of Donald Trump, now they do. Um, it's almost like something that you've dreamed about for 10 years suddenly um, happened. Um, so in, in one sense, I think that the US media is doing what journalists ought to do, which is being very aggressive about the pronouncements and actions of people who wield power. On the other hand, I'm very skeptical of it because I think it is very specific to Trump. And I think once a more normalized American political figure, even one that lies just as much, regains power, um, they're gonna return to their state. I mean, that, that, that you can just sense how eager they are for things to return to normal, not just for political power, but also for um, their own behavior. So I don't think it's a lasting change or a, an evolution in, in how journalism functions. I think it's very specific to this particular individual um, who they find very alienating for a variety of reasons. As for whether Trump is a unique threat to democracy, um, you know, I don't think he is for a couple of reasons. Um, number one is I think that sometimes threats are actually more dangerous when they're subtle and insidious. <laughs> And I think one of the things that he has done that's actually kind of a benefit is he's pulled the mask off how American power actually functions. So he's not as pretty as Obama. Um, he's not as kind of like um, committed to a morality show as George W. Bush was. But the policies, there's a great continuity between them. Um, he just hides it much more poorly. And so I think that, that what that has done is actually made people for the first time kind of aware of these threats, of how authoritarian the government can be, of how dangerous political power can be. And as I was saying earlier, there's a lot of institutions that have been really passive 
during the war on terror, during the post-9-11 era in the face of extreme abuses. And you now see a much more active media, a much more um, scrutinizing Supreme Court, a much more active Congress. And most importantly of all, and more, most inspiringly of all, you see citizen protests, millions of people going to the street with some degree of regularity. So I think as opposed to being a unique threat to democracy, in a lot of ways, Trump, just from just how kind of unstable and, and reckless and incapable he is of describing things in a manipulative way um, has kind of strengthened the checks on democracy <laughs> in an unintended but still beneficial way. Um, and so I almost see him as like this palliative, like this sort of mirror that he's held up against the American political system in a way that has been very illuminating. <laughs> I'm going to take two more, but very briefly, please, and then we're going to do a wrap up. Uh, hello, Glenn. Uh, my name's Lee. Um, inevitable from the American right, you know, since the southern strategies in the 60s, to get such an overt racist into power. And where do you see the American writers going post Trump? Could, could we take the second yeah. question, please? Hi, Brian. I'm Sam. Uh, I've got a question regarding your free speech absolutism, and especially, you know, in context of uh, professors like, you know, uh, Kianga Yamata Taylor, we've already got a suppression of speech of, you know, by black radicals, by indigenous peoples, by the state, and by right-wing uh, groups. So I'm starting to wonder if that free speech absolutism, while I understand the precedent of having, um, you know, the state control uh, the kind of speech that we already, you know, that you see the right wing come up with, especially in the context of Charlottesville. What, how do we reconcile with the fact that there's already a suppression of, you know, black radicals, indigenous peoples, considering Standing Rock, considering the amount of militarized force used against peaceful protesters, Black Lives Matter? I really want to, you know, contextualize what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that's probably the best argument against the view that I've expressed about free speech, um, which is that, look, this, the, your view is completely idealistic and ignores the realities, right? Like, there's this really pretty picture you're painting that if we just defend this principle of free speech, then everybody gets the right to free speech. And in reality, there are really powerless groups that no matter what you do are gonna end up being suppressed. And I guess my perspective comes from having been a lawyer who's actually gone into court and represented a lot of the groups that you just referenced who have had their free speech assaulted. And the same is true, of course, of the ACLU that has spent the last 10 years representing uh, Muslims accused of terrorism, um, Islamic groups who have had their free speech uh, infringed. And one of the things that you do when you represent people like that and try and defend their free speech is you go into court and you show the court the precedent that exists that says, as a matter of principle, you don't need to be evaluating the worth of the the speech offered by these individuals or groups, the principle is the government and the state and the society lacks the power to suppress the free speech rights of anybody. Does that mean it's gonna be applied perfectly? Of course not. We're a society of power and people who are less powerful are more vulnerable to unjust and oppressive treatment than people who wield greater power. But it's certainly a weapon, a really potent weapon, if you wanna represent powerless people whose free speech rights are endangered to be able to point to that principle and to your own defense of it and to courts upholding of it in other cases, rather than having to exist in a society in which the principle has already been established that you're allowed to suppress people's free speech rights if you believe their free speech is sufficiently dangerous or hateful or whatever, and then you wanna now leave it to a court or a government to say, is this Muslim speech dangerous and destructive? Is this Black Lives Matter speech dangerous and destructive because I think you're not gonna like the answer. And I'd rather, as imperfect as it is, have the overall principle upheld because for me as somebody who wants to defend people's free speech rights who lack power, I feel like my chances are much better if we're all collectively affirming that principle than if we're giving the state the right to decide whose speech can be suppressed. Um, and then just as far as this question over here about <coughs> the American right, I think one of the things that's so important to realize about Trump and we see this in so many other countries as well, um, 
you see it in Brazil where there's a far right candidate who's gonna run in 2018 who's about 15 times scarier than, than Trump, um, except for the fact that he won't have nuclear weapons, which is a pretty big exception. Um, but his name's Jair Bolsonaro. He literally craves return of military dictatorship. You see far right extremists in Europe as well. And one of the things they have in common is they don't embrace or advocate conventional conservative dogma. When Trump ran, he didn't run as a Republican in, or a conservative. He ran as somebody hating and running against the policies of both parties. He ran against the Iraq war and the war in Libya and the prospective war in Syria. He ran against the idea of cutting social programs in order to help the poor. The same thing is happening in Europe. What I see the Trump phenomenon being more than the inevitable outcome of the right um, is a collapse in confidence in the ruling class. And when there's a collapse in confidence in the ruling class, people are gonna turn to the extremes. And in some cases that can be an opportunity, which is why you see far more left-wing candidates than ever before being successful. Why someone like Jeremy Corbyn can stand up and say the same stuff that he's been saying for decades and suddenly find an audience of really energized people, especially young people who are worried about their future but it can also drive people into the arms of right-wing extremists as well who are running not as guardians of conventional conservative dogma, but as people who are railing against elites generally, and they're gonna find an audience with people who for good reason hate all elites. And that's what I think is most concerning as we look to the future. Mm. Yeah. You've been waiting so long. <laughs> Last question, just, um, I'm a lawyer and was a web developer. My question is about data retention. So we've lost that client legal privilege now with the data retention regime in Australia. Should lawyers care more about that? Should the community care more about it? And how, um, we know there's an exemption in place for journalists that there's a now warrant regime for access to that data if it's just for the purpose of finding out their sources. We know that that hasn't worked, that the Australian Federal Police have breached that. So um, in the review that might be coming up, I think in 2019 of, of the data retention regime in Australia, is there any point in us trying to carve out more exemptions and requirements for warrants for lawyers to protect that uh, privilege that's been around for centuries? Yeah, so it's such a great, you know, it's a great question. And, and the reason is, is because when we talked about mass surveillance and the threat it poses to privacy, it obscured a lot of other rights that mass surveillance threatens. So for example, how is it in a society where the government is collecting records of everybody who's talking to everybody else, um, what George Brandis thinks of as metadata, um, how is it that you can have a free press? How can you possibly communicate with sources or have sources who need confidentiality when the government is monitoring the activities of everybody's communications? So even if you don't care about privacy, you ought to care about the ability of your country to have a free press, which is directly threatened by mass surveillance. Or if you're a lawyer who needs confidentiality in how you communicate with your clients or who you communicate with on their behalf, how do you have vibrant legal representation in a framework where the government is collecting the records of everybody's communication? Even if they're not listening to the content, they're still knowing the communication activity. So my answer is, of course, we ought to care, but these battles have been progressively um, lost, um, as is evident here in Australia, for sure, which is probably one of the most pro-surveillance societies in terms of recent laws of anywhere in the Western world. So I think that one of the more important and more pressing and maybe more effective responses, short of persuading people to think differently about these issues, to care more about privacy even when terrorism is waved in front of their faces, is to start taking matters into your own hands. The tools do exist to protect your communications from government snooping. If you're a lawyer or you're a journalist and you haven't gotten your newsrooms or your law firms to install encryption or to give yourself the ability to communicate with clients and sources and um, other people, in secrecy, which those technologies do exist, I think that um, you're failing in your duties as a professional to the people to whom you owe confidentiality. There are a lot of people in this world who are working really hard to develop technological tools and weapons 
to safeguard communications from government surveillance. They're increasingly easy to use and widespread in, in terms of their availability. Um, and so I just encourage everybody who cares about privacy, even if not for yourself, but just privacy as a social good, um, to use encryption as much as possible. Because the more you do, the harder it is to surveil. And that's a really powerful weapon to use against government surveillance. Kind of last remark. I mean, I think you guys should go ahead. I feel like I spoke a lot, so you have. Uh, I know I have. That's so why we came. Well, it was a it was a great pleasure, great honor to have you here, and also because, as I was thinking and I was listening to you speaking um, about, uh, yeah, um, issues of abuse of power, but also the role of journalism in contemporary democracy, also the spread of, um, you know white you know uh, white nationalism at times and uh, the causes of it and I think uh, that it's excellent to be here talking to you and having a conversation with you because you also experienced uh, directly firsthand and also through your collaborators um, why is it that uh, advocating for the public interest sometimes especially in media discourses dominant media discourses or be scared of it and we should actually try as journalists, as media activists, as an academics, not to be afraid of speaking up. And for example, this issue of metadata laws of attention is a major issue in Australia. And if you are interested, we are gonna be having a great debate on Tuesday here at Simi and Diaz. And, uh, and I think that all citizens should be involved and uh, I, I can't stop saying that um, students should be more mobilized with this because I'm not sure that this is the lost battle yet, and I think that there is still scope for a change, and I think it's important that we all contribute to that, and I think that having you here, I hope that will inspire and mobilize many, many of our students here, and many citizens, really, so thank you. Thank you. Scott, Scott with a microphone. I wasn't expecting for today to be as funny as it was. <laughs> that takes, real skill to bring that kind of light touch. I love the way that you opened the event with the description of why it is incumbent on real journalists to offend and piss off centers of power, and that takes a lot of courage, and I want to acknowledge and thank you for that. I was caught a little bit by surprise by the importance of also occasionally offending and pissing off your audience, and that takes even more courage. So thanks for everything that you do and for joining us today. Um, friends, I, I'm not sure if you're aware how significant this event was this afternoon. I mean, it's not very often that one of the great journalists of this caliber uh, is in our midst. Uh, I think of you as a Tom Paine. Uh, you could be a George Orwell. You could be a Walter Lippmann. Um, you could be a Bob Woodward, a Martha Gellhorn. I could go through the list. Um, Fearless, uh, honest, uh, against pieties, um, humility, and self-deprecating. You even did a Trump impersonation. Uh, and I never expected that to happen. Uh, you ran through a whole range of, of uh, extraordinarily interesting and publicly important questions. Pine Gap, um, the abuse of powers as what combating it as the, as the vocation, the calling of journalism. Um, your comments about the tribalism of this unending war on, on terrorism. Um, but Anna, you spoke about the NSA and GCHQ and Five Eyes as an assault on, on democracy. Um, some of the audience I could tell was a bit shocked by your robust defense of free speech and your very practiced um, reply to the critical question of um, the ways in which those silenced can actually uh, enter that uh, uh, free speech uh, dynamic. You spoke about um, uh, the development of the growth of a precariat and, and plutocracy and the disease of spirituality. Uh, and the hopelessness that, that comes from that. 
Uh, you probably surprised more than a few in your remarks about Trump. Um, the demonization, uh, the transformation of Trump into some kind of absolute monarch is what you spoke against. And, we, and you called on us to actually stop following every tweet and stop following the breaking news and thinking about actually even the possibility that he is exposing um, the veils of power and actually um, showing that things are a lot rawer and the need to do something about that. Um, and you've spoken at the end about uh, do the techniques of encryption and so on, uh, taking advantage of what Ed Snowden, I think, calls in Citizen Four the Hydra principle. You know, that we should not forget that despite all the surveillance and Internet of Things and all those negative trends, it's possible actually to reverse those power relations and much more. Um, we're really honored. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that um, you get around to writing a story about that um, grey man <laughs> you bumped into earlier today. <laughs> um, and uh, we wish you a the rest of your stay, we hope it's pleasant and uh, come back and see us again soon. Thank you. Thank you.